Welcome everyone to C2 Creators in Conversation, where we feature comic arts creators interviewing one another and sharing their latest projects. I'm Dr. Teresa Rojas, Professor of English and Professor of Ethnic Studies at Modesto Junior College in Modesto, California, where I'm also the director of the Latinx Comic Arts Festival. The festival is the California Central Valley's international celebration of Latinx comic arts creators and friends, spotlighting Latinx cartoonists, writers, animators, artists, and comic arts educators. This is a special edition of C2, and it's part of our 2021 virtual festival. Today, I am very excited to welcome Dr. Elvira Carizal Dukes and Ronnie Dukes today for our conversation or for their conversation. I'm going to introduce them both and then I will hand over the reins for today. Dr. Elvira Carizal Dukes is an assistant professor of practice and undergraduate academic advisor for Chicano and Chicana studies at the University of Texas at El Paso where she earned a PhD in rhetoric and composition. She earned an MFA in film from Columbia University and a bachelor's from the University of Minnesota Twin Cities in journalism and Chicano studies, as well as a minor in theater arts. Her academic and creative writing and digital projects center the lives of women and racially and economically disadvantaged communities. Dr. Dukes is a comic book author, playwright and filmmaker who together with her husband, Ronnie, started dukescomics.com, an independent comics publisher whose mission is to create a positive vision for the future of black and brown people. Dr. Elvira Carizal Dukes is in conversation with Ronnie Dukes. Ronnie Dukes is a comic book creator from the South side of Chicago. Raised in South Shore, Ronnie has, has excuse me, had his first professional artist position at Gallery 37 while in high school. He went on to earn his degree in computer animation in Minneapolis before relocating to Harlem where he began to paint and exhibit work throughout the city, including multiple solo exhibitions at Columbia and group shows at the Manhattan Borough President's Office, the Harlem Arts Alliance, Community Artists Ahead of Their Time exhibit at Columbia, the Abrams Art Center, and at the Keyspan Energy Headquarters, among many others. In El Paso, Ronnie has had solo exhibits, including over two dozen paintings for his exhibits, Quills and Blacksican Soul. Duke's comics features AWOL, a full color graphic novel available in English, Japanese, and Spanish. Ronnie recently partnered with the Department of Tribal Empowerment, Isleta del Sur Pueblo, to publish Let's Talk COVID-19 2020 Pueblo Youth Guide. So welcome. Welcome to the Dukes to C2's special Latinx Comic Arts Festival edition. I'm going to leave you to it and I'll be back toward the end of the conversation. Thank you, Dr. Teresa Rojas. Uh, thank you for having us. And uh, thank you, Ronnie, for agreeing to do this. Um, I'll, I'll let you say hello if you'd like. Oh, yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I didn't want to talk over you guys. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Rojas, for having us. We're really happy to share in that we can. And, um, and, uh, All right, great. So we have uh, 45 minutes. And so my first question to you, Ronnie, since um, many people might just be tuning in and they might not know who we are. So let's just start with, you know, just tell, describe your art to us. What, what do you do? Sure. Um, I am a comic book um, artist. And uh, I actually got, have my background in computer animation and, um, and actually painting. Um, but it, uh, I, I am now a com uh, comic book artist. Um, and my work really... Uh, is, 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 is very influenced by uh, anime. Um, and, uh, and so it's a little bit more contemporary in that way. Um, but I try to capture that within um, a comic book story. So as an artist now, that's kind of where I am as a, a storyteller. 
and um, we have our own comic book company um, in order to control and influence the stories that are, are told. Yes, did you want to ask me a yeah. question? Yes, absolutely. Um, you, Elvira, um, a lot of people may not know, uh, is a playwright. And so I would love to ask Elvira, um, originally, uh, as a playwright, um, how did you make the move um, from your first genre um, of, of writing into now comic books? Thanks for that question, Ronnie. So yes, I'm a writer. And actually, my first genre in writing was journalism. And uh, that's what I went to get my bachelor's for in Minnesota, as well as I studied Chicano studies, as Dr. Rojas mentioned, and theater arts. Um, and I wasn't having such a great time in my journalism courses. I really wasn't finding a mentor, a professor that was mentoring me. Um, except there was one, it, it was actually documentary filmmaking, uh, which was also a track um, in my journalism program. Um, but at first I thought I wanted to be, or to report the news, I thought I wanted to write news. Um, and actually after I graduated, I did work for CBS News, uh, television news in uh, Minneapolis. I had the morning show at six, so I had to be there at four. I, took public transportation. Um, and I did work in the newsroom for about six months. Um, and I worked with a producer who had been there for about 15 years. She was a, a black woman. Um, and then I always looked around the newsroom and would ask myself, well, who, who's in charge here? Like, who are the executive producers? And it was all white men that never came out of their glass offices. And it literally was a glass office. They had windows that surrounded their office and they were in the corner. And I never had any sort of any type of communication with them. And so I just realized it's going to take forever before I can get out of this um, role as an associate producer, which, you know, I wanted to be a producer and, and, and produce my own segments and write my own uh, scripts. Um, and then I had an idea, I, I started to pitch stories, I wanted to do a story about Cinco de Mayo and sort of the history of it, and not just it being, you know, a, a day to drink. Um, and uh, my producer sent me over to the feed and she said, well, why don't you instead do a story on some footage? Uh, we just got a feed today, go check it out. And so then I did, and it was uh, monkeys at a zoo in San Diego uh, hitting a piñata. And so that's, um, that was her suggestion to me instead of reporting about the history of my people and my culture, um, you know, she wanted me to report on, you know, kind of like fluff news and, and it was disrespectful. I felt really um, just disregarded in that moment. And I knew that it was going to take a long time before I can ever really make a difference. Um, and so then I ended up taking on documentary filmmaking, which is what I really excelled in um, as an undergrad in Minnesota. Um, and I also, at the same time in my senior year, I took a playwriting class. Um, and it was the first time I ever wrote a play. Um, and when I did, it was just, I just feel like this whole um, area of my brain just opened up and it was, I couldn't believe how easy it was for me to, to write plays. And so I really enjoyed it. Um, so to make a long story short, I, I left journalism, I decided I didn't want to work in news and I applied to film school. Um, I did all my research and I knew I wanted to go to Columbia University because they have a strong writing program and I wanted to focus on narrative storytelling. Um, so fortunately I got accepted and, um, and that's how I made the switch to film. Um, and then your question was, how did you end up in comics? So when I started to make my first feature film, I realized it was just a really difficult task when you don't have a big production budget and experts. And so I was trying to shoot the film here in my community, in my colonia outside of El Paso, Texas. Um, and so then that's when I met Ronnie Dukes. No, I, I knew you way before that, but it was at that point where you and I, Ronnie, decided, hey, let's just, let's do the comic. And, and so that's, so you were my gateway into 
uh, the world of comics. And I have you to thank for that. Thank you for that question. So I'm sorry for that long response. Um, however, Dr. Rojas did say I, I have a better mic, uh, better sound than you. So uh, just kidding, Ronnie. Um, all right, so now let's ask you a question. Um, how has your practice changed over time? So, you know, I, I met you and you were illustrating in a student lounge in, on the campus of Minnesota. Um, and I think at the time you were drawing aliens um, with cowboy boots and hats and, and a lot of uh, cleavage, <laughs> but, it caught, right <laughs> but it caught my attention and I thought you were amazing. But, but then since then you dealt with so many different mediums. So can you tell us a little bit about how like each of those mediums has sort of led to a different level of your art making? You know, how have you combined your animation, your illustration, your painting? And, and how do you combine all of those skills into your comic book making? Sure, uh, thank you. Um, that was a great question as well. And um, let's see, I would say uh, how I kind of started, right? Is, is what we're talking about, like- Yeah, how each of your mediums, so you started in, as an illustrator and then you got into animation um, in Minnesota, and then in, in Harlem, you were painting, um, and then you came back to El Paso, and, and then you kind of combined all of those skills into comic books. So, for example, what, what skills in animation did you learn that, um, you know, how, how have those different skills and sort of stages in your life of art, um, how have they evolved over time? Like, where did you start, and where are you now in your art? Gotcha. So um, I remember when we first met, um, I was actually drawing um, in the University of Minnesota uh, in one of the dorms, uh, Territorial Hall, and I was actually drawing a character. Um, and there was a, a woman um, that was overly endowed and very overly sexualized. And I remember um, having, um, uh, Although that, you know, my peers, you know, thought, you know, I was a good artist and I was just kind of working through things and I was drawing what I, like examples of things that I saw, um, you know, as far as like other art and things like that. But I was lucky and lucky enough to have um, two uh, women actually um, in two different occasions, once at the Art Institute of Chicago and once at the University of Minnesota, who uh, basically called me out you know, in class publicly or in some way um, about my art and making me think critically about uh, my depiction of women. And um, and it was embarrassing at the time for sure. And it wasn't meant to be, I don't think mean or malicious, um, but it was definitely a learning experience. And it made me realize or look at art more critically, comic book art, especially, um, especially when you see uh, certain characters like Vampirella, Wonder Woman, um, who are definitely, you know, designed for a particular purpose. Uh, and it made me think about more practicality in my work. And so um, one of my favorite uh, influences is actually Star Trek. Um, and I love hard sci-fi. And so that I let influence my artwork uh, more than anything else, um, practicality, right? So like, um, I love doing research on, on new, New, not only new fashion, but new technology and mixing those things in um, into things like, you know, armor and to the technology that we live with and things like that. And also how we want to see the world in the future. Um, I think that is, again, a good example of like um, uh, a, diploma, a diplomatic world, you know, uh, that I would like to see uh, or universe, I say. And so I think that um, that has helped influence my work as well, because I try to put all of those things into the work that we do um, in order to make a blueprint, um, hopefully for the future in a way that people like Gene Roddenberry has, or Stephen Baxter, who is another one of my favorite um, hard sci-fi novels um, as well. Um, and as far as like just the, the, the pure skills or, or the, the techniques, I actually started illustrating. Um, I then went on um, as an illustrator uh, to study uh, I, I actually dropped out of art school at the University of Minnesota because I was bored with program. Um, there didn't seem to be any kind of connection with me at all. 
I didn't um, feel any outreach from any teachers or anything like that. So I really just kind of followed my passion elsewhere. I just left and realized I wanted to get into animations and I went on to get my degree in computer animation. Um, and what that did more than anything else was give me a different perspective on life, literally. Like I could see around things now the way I couldn't see before because I'm used to modeling and creating in three dimensions now. And so uh, one of my, uh, this is a movie called The Other Guys where somebody develops an app called Facebook. So I feel like I could draw things uh, from the front that I can only see from the back now. Like it, it's a weird skill that I, I feel like I've developed. And so that's, that's helped me um, become a better artist in that, in, in that sense. Um, I went on to paint uh, in Harlem um, where I actually painted on the street, um, not on the street, but I actually sold my work on the street um, from found objects I used to paint on and uh, in order to pay bills and things like that. And that's where I got my first exposure um, where someone invited me to have my first solo show um, at Columbia University, totally coincidentally, that I you know, was going there at the time and, and, and somebody, an administrator came and saw me completely separately. And that started my painting career um, where I've had about 13 different um, art shows, um, solo and group since then. And then, uh, and now as a painter, I realized that my work wasn't accessible to everybody um i have to, and this was before like internet and social media and and so many things like that um this was like probably the early 2000 uh, i think the smart the first smartphone came out like in 2006 or so and so i um i uh, i decided to i wanted to put everything together in a collection where everybody could get to it and that's where we together came up with the idea that i should get into comics um and um and that's been one of the best decisions and that's how i ended up from where I am to where I am today. Thank you. And uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and ask you a question now. Um, as a writer, um, you've written in different genres, um, documentary, comics, and, and uh, film. What would you say is your favorite character that you've written and why? Great question. Um, you know, I, I love all my characters and, and I feel like I am at different stages in my life when, when I'm writing certain characters. So, um, so honestly, I, I would have to say that right now, just because it's the most, uh, the closest thing to me as far as like time, I would say uh, Cruz Ochoa from AWOL. Uh, she's a Latina protagonist and uh, she's a, a Chicana soldier that leaves the military without permission and she's searching for her brother because he's been kidnapped um, and she does ask for permission but doesn't get it and so she does it anyway because it's about family um, and so I think I uh, probably relate to her the most right now even though we, we're, we're as you know we're working on new projects right now and I probably relate more to those characters but um, but we're, I'm, I'm not going to talk about those projects yet. They're coming out soon, though, this year. Um, but Cruz Ochoa from AWOL, the, the protagonist, um, I love her because she's she's just so smart and uh, tough and witty. And, you know, she she can read people. Um, and and I love her loyalty to to her country, the military. But at the same time, I love her loyalty to her family and um, and, and just how she's dealing with that situation. And, um, and, you know, we get to see her sort of grapple with having to choose and, and to make tough decisions. And, um, and so that's what I love about her. I, I love the way that she's illustrated as far as being, you know, feminine, but still, you know, strong. And she's not um, someone that you really want to, you know, disrespect. Um, and, and I just love her courage um, and, and I love just uh, her story. Um, and so, so yes, yeah, so I would say Cruz Ochoa is probably my favorite character right now. So thanks for that question. Um, can you say a little bit more about how, when you researched fashion and tech, um, how did you, for example, incorporate that in AWOL? Um, I think that there are a lot of great resources that exist um, for 
research um, now, um, certainly Google and search engines, um, but uh, definitely there's apps and uh, websites in particular like uh, Pinterest and um, DR and things like that where people like really share a lot of really great ideas. Um, but especially I love uh, looking at fashion, uh, uh, in particular uh, runway fashion, uh, things that are kind of, it's, it's runway fashion is really like concept art. You know, um, these are things that will be uh, more on the streets, you know, in the future and stuff like that. And I also look at uh, futurists, um, like futurism as a website as well, to see like what kind of technology is also uh, going to be uh, potentially married up with this fashion, this art. Um, and so like in AWOL, for instance, I marry a lot of like, of course, idea of fashion, but I didn't want to push it too far into the future, but with cruises, uniform for instance i use a uh, reactive uh, fabric um, very similar to what you see in um uh, i can't remember the name but it's a movie with uh, will smith and his son where they are traveling through space uh, and they're trying to get off planet earth after earth that's the name of the film and basically he has a, a, a suit that reacts to his environment and so i wanted to do something like that uh in a more practical way and something that we could use so what the military have in, in our book are uh, um, glow according to uh, the state that the soldier is in um, and police as well. And so if the officer of whatever uh, uh, branch is uh, in peace mode, it goes blue. Um, if they're in a more uh, investigative or uh, uh, caution mode, if they're in battle mode or if things are, are, are heightened and there's definite danger, it goes red. And so that way, the uh, public, um, who may be bystanders, can assess the situation at a glance and know to disperse or to know that there's danger um, and so that uh, there's less confusion. And so that's one of the ways that I incorporate um, in technology, in fashion, um, and um, that's only the tip of the iceberg. Um, I will go ahead and ask you a question now. Um, as a writer, um, what do you consider an example of good writing? Um, what writing has spoke to you um, as far as like something that uh, maybe you go back to periodically? Um, maybe someone might go back to their favorite um, comic or favorite piece of art. So let's see. Um, so the question is what I consider good writing to be. Um, well, I think it definitely has a lot to do with emotion and, um, and the human experience and, you know, things that anyone can relate to, regardless of your economic standing, your cultural background, or where you're from. Um, so like, for example, um, a comic that one of the first comics that I read that really affected me and um, sort of helped me to feel confident that this is a genre that I could write in because I wasn't sure if I would be accepted um, as far as like my storytelling. I tend to do a lot of uh, drama and just like corruption and and I hadn't read enough comics to know that that's actually what comics are all about. Um, but the comic that I read that inspired me the most is The Crow uh, by uh, James Obar um, and, and just the story of, you know, his girlfriend, you know, being attacked and, and murdered on the side of the road, you know, that whole story and just his evolution to seek revenge um, and then just the simplicity of the art as well. I mean, it's very expressive, but it's, you know, black and white, um, and, but it's a beautiful story. And so The Crow is like an example of great writing for me in a comic um, because of the story, the strong uh, relationship, and because he really makes you feel and, and you're with his main character. You want revenge just as bad as, you know, as the main character in that book. Um, uh, in it, another example of great writing as far as like a documentary film that um, I that sort of helped me steer more towards filmmaking was 
the film, the documentary film by Lourdes Portillo, uh, Señoritas Extraviadas, uh, Missing Young Women, which is about the murders of women in Juarez. And uh, again, very strong, emotional, pull, very dramatic storytelling. Also, the fact that it's based on reality and, and fact um, is also very powerful. But um, just, you know, again, even in documentary films, you still have to put a script together and figure out how to start, how, you know, what the middle and should be and what the, how it should conclude. Um, so Lourdes Portillo definitely um, uh, inspires me as a filmmaker, as a writer in, in film. Um, and, you know, <laughs> some of the, um, I don't know, the, I'll just leave it at that. Um, I think those are, are two great inspirations of mine. Um, I just want to end by saying that The Crow was the, the first graphic novel that I actually bought ever in the 90s as well. Yeah. I knew there was a reason why I, I, was, I chose to hang out with you. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> so, so we have similarities. And I think we knew that from the beginning. And I think that that's why, you know, we're able to mix our storytelling with your visual storytelling, because I think there's, you know, a heartbeat that is similar that sort of um, unifies our work and, and makes it work. It doesn't feel jarring, I don't think. Um, so anyway, so yeah, thank you for saying that. Right. Um, all right, so let's see. You know, one of the things I, I've had the privilege of being able to have to have witnessed your paintings, your um, your shows that you had in New York City, and specifically like the ones at Columbia. Um, and we actually teamed up again when I did a play at Columbia. Escaping Juarez was produced, and um, I asked them if I could have the outdoor gallery of the theater so that we could have our art exhibit. And it was just, again, perfect um, mix of mediums, but also similar topics, but still had the same sort of type of feel and genre. Um, so can you talk a little bit about like the actual process, like of how you use plexiglass and how you paint it on both sides and kind of what you learned about that process? Sure. Um, that was actually the most fun I had doing an installation. I think, um, first of all, um, we were working out of a um, one bedroom uh, Manhattan apartment. Um, and the studio that I was using to do this work was really the entire living room kitchen area. Um, and I was working four feet um, high by about three feet wide. Um, it may have been high, but definitely no less than four feet high. And um, I basically like a, a, a very huge comic page. And uh, working in, living in New York at that time, there's so many resources um, that have since gone by the wayside or shut down, uh, you know, as gentrification happens. Um, but for instance, I used to love to shop and get all of my supplies on Canal Street. And um, all of, uh, it was a great art supply store, you know, there uh, right off of Clown Broadway ish. And, uh, but one of my favorite stores is actually um, a plastic supplier. Um, and so I would actually buy resin, which is basically a really thick, um, like a couple inch thick, maybe not a couple inch, but like one inch, uh, as little as eight, but I like to go a little bit thicker. Um, uh, and basically it was like a piece of glass. And so when I would paint, um, I was thinking in a way that an animator would about a spell. So I would draw or paint, excuse me, the background backwards on the back of the glass. And so I would decide what was um, in the most foreground and then start painting that and then work my way into the background. Um, and by the time I couldn't even see the front of the, the black screen anymore, and then I flip it around, and uh, do the actual foreground of what was actually above everything else. And so it, gave, it, it uh, provided a really great sense of depth, um, especially the thicker the flexi was. So it was almost like, I don't wanna say holographic, but it had the same feeling of like movement. Um, and so those were, that was awesome. And, and the show was called Black Roots. So it was one of the shows and there was another called um, Dying to Live, exactly. Um, and uh, it's just really great 
uh, working large like that and have them to do whatever I, I wanted to do, basically. And so I was able to, uh, by dying to live, actually, um, really help to complement the story of the play, your play that was as well. Um, and so I was able to think about secondary stories and, and, and things that we weren't able to maybe explore and play. You know? um, I, I, was a, I, I was thinking of making my, my own stories. Um, and so that was such a great experience and probably one of my most favorite, or definitely my most favorite um, installation uh, at Columbia. Uh, cool. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that question. And I will ask you a question. Uh, let's see. Having had the opportunity to travel, um, most recently, I would say probably Japan, where we debuted um, AWOL, the Japanese edition. Um, what has inspired you? Excuse me. How how has this inspired you in your writing? Um, has your travels made it into your writing? Great. Um, definitely, I would say I'm always doing character studies, no matter where I am, um, and it's one of the reasons why I love public transportation and just kind of walking and, and just witnessing everyday life and um, people, especially when we travel like on planes and buses and trains and all the different modes of transportation that we've uh, ridden. Um, I would say definitely as far as like characters, it helps me to, you know, everywhere I've gone, I've always, I've always kept a journal my entire life. And so I'm always writing down impressions or, or things that I've um, witnessed or seen or that I loved or frustrations. Um, and so these are also scenarios that might kind of creep in, um, but more, but I haven't really written anything that is specifically about a travel adventure, except our first zine. Um, so Ronnie and I, we, we, we learned about zines in the last couple of years, especially after attending SoulCon. Um, it was my first time learning about zines. And so you and I, we decided we wanted to do one. Um, and so we actually did one called Journey to Ko, uh, which is a uh, Japanese hip hop artist in, in Japan um, who is just amazing. I love his work. Um, I love his story. You know, he's definitely is someone who relates to struggle and coming from poverty. And I, I believe one of his um, parents committed suicide. And uh, so anyway, he's just an awesome, amazing storyteller through his music of hip hop. So again, emotion and being able to relate to um, stories and struggle is something that makes an artist stand out. And so for me, I had to go to see Ko. And, and, um, and so it was one of the things that drew me to want to even travel to Japan was just because I really wanted to, to meet him or see him. Um, and so we actually had quite a journey just trying to get to him. Um, we took a bullet train from Tokyo to um, uh, Nagoya. Um, and so a, a bullet train in, in other places around the world, such as Japan, uh, these are trains that are like 400 miles an hour. I think they're, they're like super fast and, and you normally a trip that would take you maybe a few days will take you a matter of hours. Um, and so that was a cool experience. And then once we got there, we didn't have tickets. And so we had to kind of show up and um, figure that out. Um, and then I think eventually the people just kind of felt sorry for us or I don't know, but they let us in. Um, but one of the things that I saw or witnessed while we were there was I, I witnessed um, Japoneros, you know, so Japanese people that are cholos and cholas and they were in the lobby like waiting to get into see Ko and I couldn't believe it right so I felt like I was in high school again and just kind of seeing all my friends um so our our zine journey to Ko is is based on that experience but I think more than anything like as far as travel in general it's made me think about like being multilingual incorporating other languages reaching out to an international audience um, and it also makes me realize why visual rhetoric or the visual storytelling is more important than ever. And sometimes even beyond the text, right, is 
you know, the, because how are you going to communicate with people who don't speak your language? And so when we went to Tokyo Comic Con, the fact that people were sort of taken by what they would see our banners and then they would come and, and find out who we were and we were able to have conversations with people even though we didn't speak the same language but they were drawn to the art and fortunately our book is in Japanese so once they started reading it they knew that we were you know legit like they really liked the translation um, and you know but again they were drawn to the art to begin with and so so I think a lot about accessibility, how to be accessible to more than one type of reader. So being multilingual, you know, thinking about the font size, thinking about, you know, your, um, your, your formatting. Um, so, so that's, you know, that's how it's changed me. And I think um, there's a, a question to kind of follow up to that, right? So, so what advice might you have for those who are not travelers or who don't see themselves that way, particularly folks who don't have the experience of coming from families who encourage travel? Cool. So I definitely come from a family that did not encourage travel. You know, like when I went to college in Minnesota, that was my first time leaving El Paso. Um, and so for me, travel is something that I had to sort of learn on my own through my college experiences. I started going to conferences, you know, so student conferences are a great, great way to kind of get into travel because one, you are able to apply for student funding um, and you are able to go as a group with your classmates. And so it makes it safer. Um, so that's how I started to travel was through conferences, going to college. Um, so what I would say for people who don't actually physically go to other countries or places or like right now we're in the pandemic, uh, you can still go on YouTube like I watch, you know, Ronnie and I we watch videos about Japan all the time, or even just other places. Um, uh, you can read books, you know, I, I anytime I travel anywhere I, I go to the library and I check out books about that place and I learn everything I can about it and I even start to pick up the language. So even when we went to Tokyo Comic Con, Ronnie and I, we made sure to memorize specific phrases, um, you know, that we could use in engaging with our customers. Uh, so it really is up to. I just want to say, like, also to uh, one of the things we researched was customs and things like that to not inadvertently offend and things like that, too, because there's a lot of intricacies and in different people's customs um, that one should know as well. Definitely. So. I would say um, do, you know, think of travel as just leaving the, your imagine, leaving your current reality in your mind and kind of imagining another place, whether you're like confined to your space or even just walking around your neighborhood or just going to a coffee shop or even when you have to go get groceries or, you know, just pay attention to um, the colors, the, the cultural, how people behave and interact with each other. And uh, for me, any, you know, anything visual and oral is a way of traveling. Anything that's not something that I personally experience is like, an ex it's someone else's experience. You know how they say you don't walk in my shoes. Well, that's why I, I make it a point to be conscious and to sort of try to see other people traveling throughout their days in their shoes um, and as a writer, I think about those things a lot and I write about it. So I hope that um, helped to answer that question. Um, of course, if you can. Novel, I definitely suggest novel. Definitely, for sure. Um, so Ronnie, can you talk a little bit, you, you talked a little bit earlier about what inspires you. Like you mentioned anime, you mentioned, you know, certain people like Star Trek and, um, can you talk a little bit more about um, like what inspires, uh, for example, a wall? Like, since we can't, yeah. So talk about a wall. Like, what inspired um, you building this world that you didn't grow up in, um, and and what inspired you know any of the coloring or the uh, the visuals, the storyboards? Talk a little bit more about your inspiration. Sure, definitely. Um, AWOL, um, first of all, you know, having learned what I've learned about, um, like I learned about representation um, early 
thankfully. Um, as, uh, as for what I, from the story that I mentioned earlier, as far as the way that I would like to pick women and things like that. And so like having learned those lessons early gave me the, uh, I think, freedom to think differently than a lot of other artists that I was coming up with. And so my thing was all about representation and normalcy. Um, so uh, I never, like, I love Black Panther, the film, the current comics. I love Luke Cage, the, the, the TV show and the current comics. But growing up, I did not like them at all um, because I saw them as, as almost like a, um, a pandering, you know, um, because they weren't created by Black people. They weren't made by Black people. Like, Black people had nothing to do with those characters, you know what I mean? And so um, I wanted to, uh, I, I basically wanted, and also too, it was, all, it was always about them being Black as opposed to them being a hero. Um, like Peter Parker never had to worry about, you know, those kinds of issues, nor did Superman or, or Wonder Woman or anything like that. And so uh, the fact that Black characters had to deal with hood issues and, and like the Black Panther fighting the KKK, which is awesome, you know, but, you know, it, it, it wasn't until later that he had Galactic and, and Interstellar and things like that, like super, like uh, his counterparts, his peers. And so I wanted to make sure that our characters, um, the, the characters that I create, felt like people who were like your neighbors, you know, people who were uh, uh, somebody who, instead of uh, realizing that they were a special person because of something, they actually worked towards those things. Um, they actually studied math, they studied science, um, you know, like where things like uh, coding is like a normal part of, of life. Like, you know, you grow up, you know, you learn to read, write code, because those are the things that you would need because we all need to repair things and, and things like that. And so that's the kind of like kind of uh, world that I wanted to kind of depict in, in, in comics and why I you know, like what, what inspires me, I guess, so to speak, in that, in that way. Um, and as far as the colors and, and my style, um, I have a lot of different uh, influence or people who influence me, uh, influences, uh, was I? <laughs> but um, I, one of my main ones uh, most recently was is Lasan Thomas. Um, Lasan Thomas uh, created, I uh, actually did the artwork for the Boondocks. He did the artwork for Ang or the Avatar, Korra, um, uh, he did uh, a lot of other things, Cannon Busters, which are currently on uh, Netflix, which I definitely suggest uh, people have, have to look at, just because the quality is awesome. It's great. Um, anime is a different kind of storytelling, and I wouldn't really get into that because I really want, I love more Western style storytelling, but I love the quality of anime and, and the work that goes into it, and that's what I get from that. Um, also, too, uh, having gone to Tokyo Comic Con, we were sitting a couple of uh, seats down from Kim Kim Jung Kim Jung Ji, and uh, he is a wonderful, like phenomenal illustrator. And I felt like I've learned through osmosis, um, in the sense where he's somebody who works from shape, you know. And these are the things that I've always known. But you know how they say it's always nice to take a refresher. And so I, you know, just took some time for the past couple of years just really studying uh, Kim Jung Ji. And, um, and the way that he works. And it's not like I am trying to emulate his work, but just his method. And so now being able to see this shape, mixing that with what I've learned from 3D animation and painting and things like that, my work has become more precise and more, um, more than it ever could have been even just a couple of years ago. Um, that I, I felt like I hit an evolution point and I can draw anything now. And um, and that's what we'll see in our books coming up for 2021. We have um, a graphic novel coming out this year, and we also have a trade comic coming out this year. Um, both are going to be huge um, as far as like the coloring and, and the, the lush environments and the action. But also, too, you're going to see more of the world that I'm trying to build, or we're trying to build, excuse me, um, because we're futurists. And uh, we want to help to create uh, a blueprint, and that's what these books will be. All right, and so I think that's all I have to say about that. Um, so now moving on, um, let's see. 
Okay, that's all we uh is there a particular um event in your life or a time when you realized that writing was really what you wanted to do? Um what, what was, was the thing that what was the thing that made you uh go all in in writing and uh creating these stories as opposed to keeping them and by the wayside as a hobby and something you wouldn't share with someone else? I think the event that um led me on this path at least professionally especially when you want to be an artist it's scary to commit to that life because there's sometimes you know no guaranteed income or no guaranteed success no guaranteed anything um and but when i wrote that first play in minnesota and it, and then it got produced by a student theater group i got a grant it, the play also got entered into a the kennedy center american college theater festival uh, which is a national competition and judges come to your school and they you know consider you for different awards um, and so my play was called father shadow sombra del padre it's a feature length dramatic play it's my first play so of course it's not perfect but the emotion obviously um, and the the characters and the story you know connected with the audience and with the judges because they um, had my, some of my actors advance for acting competitions and uh, regional um, acting awards. And then, of course, my play got the second uh, national runner up for best play overall out of, you know, everyone who entered the competition. So um, to me, that's a huge accomplishment. Um, but also there was a specific award for Latinos. It was called the CTV uh, Latino Playwriting Award. Uh, which was sponsored by Jeff Valdez. Um, and so he um, he's the co-founder of uh, New Cadence Productions and he's my mentor. Um, and he gave me this playwriting award, which um, at that moment, it was really one of the most biggest awards I'd ever received, especially for creative work. I did get an Emmy award for my uh, a group documentary that we worked on for our final project when I was a senior in college. Um, but again, that's, you know, it was around the same time that I knew I didn't want to do news reporting um, and theater just kind of made me realize I wanted to get into fiction and creating characters. Um, so anyways, I, I will just, I know we're running out of time, but I'll just say that that um, experience of getting that award really gave me that confidence to <laughs> pursue fiction writing as a profession. Um, and so, um, so yeah, so that, so thank you for that question, Ronnie. And one last question real quick. It's a quick one. Where can people find you, Ronnie? Like, uh, you know, you, you mentioned you have a couple of projects coming out this year and I know you can't really talk about them, um, but if people want to get the news, you know, do you have a newsletter or, or what, how, tell us, how can people get the news from you? Sure, absolutely. Um, you can um, reach us both uh, via dukescomics.com. Um, and uh, dukescomics.com actually leads you to uh, link you to all of our social media, um, Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter, and all those good, good, good platforms. And um, it also links you to our book. And if you go to dukescomics.com and you go to a web comics page, you can actually see for free uh, the story that we were talking about, our zine, which is available as a three-dimensional flippable comic on our website. So dukescomics.com and uh, go to the contact us page and we'll keep you up to date on our new books um, if you just enter your name and email and that's all you got to do. Let me unmute myself and then <laughs> I will have, uh, I have two follow up questions. We had just talked about the whole unmuting thing too in the beginning. So um, I love that things, things happen. I don't seem to learn from them, but I want to go back for a second and then touch on one other thing before we end. And that is this Emmy award. So I want to hear about this Emmy award that you are Emmy award winning. So tell us a little bit more about that. 
Sure. Um, and so when I was a senior at the University of Minnesota, it was um, our final project. So I mentioned I started off like in news writing and then television news writing. And then the track that I ended up sort of focusing on was documentary filmmaking. And so our in our faculty, our professor, Melody Gilbert, she um, had the class co-produce a full length uh, documentary called Our Bodies Ourselves, Our Bodies slash Ourselves with a question mark. So it has to do with like, um, and to be honest with you, this was kind of before people started talking about like Latinx or genderless or, you know what I mean? We were really ahead of the game now that I think about it, because this was in the year 2000 when we made this, 1999. So it was about like how we define our bodies and, and how our bodies make us who we are or make us who we are not. And so it was a lot about like perceptions of body and self and, and the things that we do to our bodies to in order to feel more like ourselves or to kind of redefine who we are. It was a really deep, thoughtful documentary. Um, and so each of my classmates, we all sort of just we're in charge of different stories and then we just put it together and um it got entered into the minnesota like emmy awards and and so our project got an emmy um so that was pretty cool so i graduated uh with a bachelor's with an emmy with a published play and like these couple of you know playwriting awards and then and then an acceptance to columbia that's phenomenal. And I want to encourage you to add that to your, you know, your intro Emmy award winning author, playwright, you know, whatever the, the, the exact term is because own it. Right. That is, I got a chill when I heard that. I was like, wait a minute, wait, wait, we have to talk about that. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for that. And then um, the other thing I want to make sure that we hear um, a little bit about is that I understand that the two of you have been collaborating with the Alzheimer's Association West Texas chapter to provide free um, journal writing and doodling workshops for caregivers to promote stress reduction and relaxation. And I would absolutely love to hear more about that as well. Yes, th thank you for that, Dr. Rojas. I'm so glad that you mentioned it because it's such an important part of what we're doing right now. And so my uh, PhD degree is in rhetoric and composition and specific, and it's in an English department, you know, and people sometimes are confused about my degree. They think I read literature, um, but I don't like specifically, I study visual rhetoric and how we compose messages visually to tell stories and to communicate. Um, and, uh, but so, what that led me to is is a field, a growing field in rhetoric and composition, which is graphic medicine. So how do we um, educate and bring awareness and advocate for, for example, Alzheimer's awareness or, you know, a cure for Alzheimer's um, through visual mediums. And so, um, so yeah, so they asked us to specifically do um, comics uh, comic writing or journaling and doodling uh, workshops for stress reduction um, and for relaxation. Uh, so it's a way for us to incorporate what we do, our comics, with working with the community. Um, but even more specifically for me as a, as a rhetoric scholar, I'm incorporating uh, visual rhetoric into the work that I'm trying to do right now and, and specifically through graphic medicine. So, you know, and, and there's so much um, information that needs to be produced that's in multilingual languages, for example, you know, how is a young kid whose abuelita is experiencing Alzheimer's supposed to learn about what abuelita is going through if there's no children's book you know, that's in bilingual, you know, English and Spanish that teaches them what that's about. So um, I don't know, Ronnie, if you want to say anything more about the Alzheimer's um, workshops, but yeah, thank you for that, Dr. Rojas. No, I, all I would say is it's a great program. And even if you're not, the workshops were, they're in writing and doodling and they're a great way to relax um, and to uh, collect your thoughts and to take stock of the things that you've gone through. Um, and so with that in mind, um, it's actually uh, really useful to anyone, especially anyone who's feeling stressed uh, via uh, the quarantine, the pandemic, 
uh, working situations. There's so many different things that are happening in our lives right now that are causing um, stress that we didn't have maybe uh, a year or so ago. And so workshops like these, which are free, um, are a great way to um, assess those things um, in advance of, of, of mental health or, or seeing a counselor or something like that. This is something that you can do for yourself uh, to take a proactive step to stay healthy. And there's also recordings of two of our workshops on our website, dukescomics.com under, um, uh, I think it's under workshops. And so people will be able to actually experience the entire workshop just by watching the videos on our website. Fantastic. And I will, if, if, if they're connectable, I will certainly connect those to the Latinx Comic Arts Festival page. That would be great to have those. Um, so yeah. I want to give you an opportunity. First of all, let me say um, that I absolutely love that you have gone the graphic medicine route. That's one of my specialty fields. And we do not have enough of this work for Latinos, Latinxes, etc. cetera. Um, there just isn't enough out there. So I'm really happy that you're doing this work and I'm very happy to highlight it as well. And I want to give you the final opportunity. Um, let's start with Ronnie. Do you have, um, what final thoughts would you like uh, to share with everyone? Um, maybe something just that you want people to keep in mind or something about yourself, whatever you would like to end with. Um, definitely, I would like to start by encouraging people who um, are interested in creating art, telling their stories, to do so. Um, it's possible to publish your own work. Um, you don't need a large publisher. You can do it yourself with as little as 20 pages. Um, and so it's a great way to create a passive income. It's a great way to get your work out into the world and, um, and to receive uh, the criticism, critical the critical um, feedback that we need in order to get better. Um, so definitely put your work out there, use the resources that are available um, in so many different ways. If you want to print t-shirts, if you want to publish books, if you want to create wallets, I mean, you can do it. Um, the, the sky's the limit and you can do it on demand so you don't have to come out of pocket. And lastly, I'd love to throw all of everyone to check in with Duke's Comics on Instagram, uh, Duke's Comics underscore publisher. Uh, check in with us at Facebook at dukescomics.com and at dukescomics on Twitter as well. Um, we'll definitely keep you up to date with a lot of really great stuff coming up. Like we're not exaggerating when we say that. Um, we're really excited about the work that's coming out. And um, also it's going to be joined with things like animation um, and um, hopefully other big things like that coming out really soon. So uh, dukescomics.com. Awesome. And, we don't and I guess my final thoughts um, are uh, basically as, as a writer, if, if this is something um, that you want to pursue, I would encourage writers to explore all genres. Um, when I was an undergrad, I think my advisors could sense that I, I wanted to be a writer, but they that I wasn't sure exactly what genre. And so it was my advisors who were saying, well, take poetry, take playwriting, take, you know, they, they, they knew I wasn't having such a good time in journalism, which is what I thought was going to be my passion. And so then, yeah, so I sought out advice and I listened to my counselors and I took different classes and different workshops. And eventually I found playwriting, which led to film, which which now ultimately led to uh, academic writing. Uh, so I'm, I'm a doctor, I'm Dr. Carisal Dukes and academic writing is so important because um, if, if our stories and our work is not cited in publications, then it's like we don't exist. And so we need to start uh, becoming uh, the experts of our own experiences. We need to become the experts of, of the subjects that directly impact us and our communities. And we need to be the ones that are publishing academic work and scholarship and citing each other um, because we're the ones living this experience firsthand. Um, and so, so, so that's why it's important for me at this point in my career to now think about scholarship, academic scholarship, and to think about the textbooks and the resources that young people are learning from, you know? And, and so I wanna make sure that our history is being documented and and that's and and I've just learned after all this time that that's how to do it. <laughs> you know, we need to we need to become published and we need to be talked about in in scholarship and all academic works. 
Thank you so much for that. And you make such a good point. I have to point out um, the look on Ronnie's face when you said, now I'm Dr. Alvira Carizal Dukes. He was like, yeah, <laughs> that's fantastic. I love that so much. But this a, idea- a long, wonderful road. Yep, I can, I can imagine. <laughs> um, but this idea that we have to choose only one thing is just a complete artificial boundary, right? And I went through the same thing where I was told, well, are you gonna be an academic or are you gonna be an artist? You know, pick a lane. And then we had a, a speaker, this was at Ohio State, who had just done a, a work of fiction and bilingual work of fiction. Um, and I asked him the question, like, how are you allowed to do this? And his response was, well, I didn't ask permission. And that's the thing, right? We don't need to ask permission. We just need to do what we want to do. And exactly, trailblaze your path if that's what you need to do. But do not call on gatekeepers to decide what you can and cannot do. So you can do the poetry, you can do the art, you can do the writing, you can do the comics and be an academic or be whatever else it is that you would like to be. These things are acceptable because these are the things that we choose. And I think that's an important message. I cannot yeah, thank like, you. Sorry, go ahead, Ronnie. I was gonna say, it's like staying off somebody's radar until you're strong. Yes, and I cannot thank you enough for this time. Um, I could go another hour, but we do need to end. Unfortunately, I want to remind everyone that um, to see more and learn more about the Dukes, who I say have the coolest name in comics, you can uh, register on dukescomics.com, uh, go to their contact page and register there. Huge, huge thanks to Elvira Carizal Dukes and to Ronnie Dukes for an excellent conversation today. And I wanna thank everyone for watching. Again, I'm Dr. Teresa Rojas reminding you to create the stories that you want to see in the world. Thank you so much. <laughs>